Spider-Man is a character that needs zero introduction. Everyone knows who he is, everyone knows what he can do. I myself have loved the character for as long as I can remember. When I was really little I remember watching some episodes of the 90's cartoon on Jetix, and I even had a box of set of the 60's show that I watched all the time. Then around middle school I got back into superheroes, and I watched all of the Raimi movies. I liked them a lot back then, and upon revisiting these films recently, I love them more than ever. So why not dive into what makes the Sam Raimi trilogy so great? But I should probably preface this video by saying that I'm not too familiar with Spider-Man comics, so I won't be discussing these movies as adaptations. They do a great job of correctly portraying the characters, but that's not where my focus is. So with that out of the way, let's get into it. Spider-Man 1 starts off simple, we're introduced to Peter Parker. He's this nerdy kid who gets bullied and has a big crush on a girl named Mary Jane Watson. During a class field trip we also meet Peter's close friend Harry Osborn and his father Norman, who we'll get into later. I love the bit where Harry tells Peter to talk to MJ, but since he's shy, Harry just effortlessly approaches her. It's pretty funny. Peter does get a chance to talk to her though, but then he's bit by the radioactive spider and, well, you know what happens next. Peter wakes up above his hell, and what happens at school are some of my favorite scenes in the movie, like the tray thing, freaking iconic. I just love the opening moments of this movie in general. It sets up the characters in the best way possible, and it has a lot of charm to it. It's hard not to smile at Peter trying out his new powers or seeing him be really awkward around MJ. I especially like the scene where the two of them are talking in the backyard. It feels really down to earth and it's just a nice scene all around. I hunch. Don't. I think Tobey Maguire did a stellar job playing Peter Parker. People really resonate with him and it's not hard to see why. He managed to make him really geeky and awkward, but also incredibly likable. Tobey is also really good at portraying emotion, whether it's subtle or not. It's just an iconic performance that has really stood the test of time. So yeah, the movie starts off pretty charming and funny, but things get serious quick. Peter ends up thinking he needs a car to impress MJ. So he lies to his guardians and says that he'd be going to the library to study, when in reality he just wants to win money at a wrestling match. However, things don't go as planned, and Peter lets the man who ends up killing his uncle run free. Peter then has to face the huge consequences of this. He becomes angry, vengeful even, and goes on to find the murderer, only to find out that he's the same guy he let free. It's heavy stuff, and it's one of the more visceral scenes in the movie but I'm forgetting a pretty major part, and that's Uncle Ben's words. Before Peter leaves for the library, uh, his uncle talks to him. He tells him that just because you can do something doesn't always mean you should, and that with great power comes great responsibility. This is an incredibly iconic line for a reason, and it echoes throughout this film in a beautiful way. Peter feels responsible for his uncle's death, and becoming Spider-Man means that he is responsible for keeping the city safe even if it's to the press's dismay. Who is Spider-Man? He's a criminal, that's who he is. A vigilante, a public menace. What's he doing on my front page? Okay, real quick, I have to mention how incredible J. Jonah Jameson is in this trilogy. J.K. Simmons was such an excellent casting choice. He looks the part, and his voice and delivery are perfect. Like, this is without a doubt the definitive depiction of the character. He's just iconic. But I digress. Peter also has to deal with keeping his loved ones safe from harm because he quickly learns that he'll always have villains. Which brings me to the one, the only, Green Goblin. Now in the grand scheme of Spider-Man media, he's never been my absolute favorite, but in terms of the Raimi trilogy, oh he's probably the best. I mean you could certainly debate that, but for me, he's top tier. Willem Dafoe just went all in on this role. His voice is menacing, his facial expressions are demented, it's perfect. Seeing him go back and forth between the goblin and his normal self during the mirror scene really showcases Defoe's acting chops, and it's super entertaining to watch. But what I like most about his performance is how he can add this slight amount of devilishness to the simplest of lines. Like, you watch it and you know something's up. I think the Thanksgiving scene shows this off extraordinarily well. The deranged look on his face after Aunt May scolds him is just incredible. Oh, and the way Norman finds out Peter is Spider-Man is just so well done. 
I love the suspense you get when everyone's looking for Peter along with how the blood slowly starts to drip from his arm, narrowly missing Norman's shoulder. But he still notices it, then once he sees Peter's cut, it all falls into place, and you know shit's about to go down. Picking Green Goblin was such a great choice for this first movie, but there's a hint of camp to the character, but he still poses a huge threat. Peter having to deal with him terrorizing those close to him cements how much responsibility he'll have to bear as Spider-Man, but he pulls through in the end, even if Norman didn't. Excellent villain. Although this movie doesn't end with sunshine and rainbows, Harry sees Peter lay his father's corpse right down before his eyes, leading him to believe that he's a murderer. But then at his funeral, MJ ends up telling Peter that she really does love him. It's exactly what he wanted, but he says no. He says no to something he's wanted since he was a little kid, because with great power comes great responsibility. If the events of this movie taught Peter anything, it's that. Being Spider-Man comes with a lot of costs, tensions between friends stir up, his family is put in danger, and he obviously has to keep a pretty big secret 24-7. This film does such a great job at being an origin story, both in terms of Spider-Man's character and being an excellent big screen debut. The themes of responsibility present throughout this movie might be done in a simple way, but it's more than effective. Like I said earlier, Uncle Ben's words hold weight throughout the entire movie. Peter learns what it means to be Spider-Man, as well as everything that comes along with that, and it's nothing short of excellent. Spider-Man 2. This is frequently considered to be the best in the trilogy, as well as one of the best superhero movies of all time, and I have to agree. The first movie definitely works on its own, but they clearly had a sequel in mind. Certain plot points that were set in place could be easily expanded upon, and Spider-Man 2 more than delivers. This movie really focuses on the side effects of being Spider-Man. Peter bears this huge responsibility that takes up a lot of his time, and his personal life is pretty uh, messy because of it, which is something the film's opening shows off really well. He works a crappy job that he's quickly fired from, his grades are slipping in college, and he's not there for his friends and family as often, all because he's busy being a superhero. It's such a great and effective opening. Plus you get the pizza scene, and who doesn't love that? Everyone around Peter is really concerned for him, whether it's his professor, Aunt May, or Mary Jane Watson. The first film left off with him turning her down, and now we see the aftermath of that. At Peter's birthday, you start to see the cracks in their relationship show up, along with the fact that she has a new boyfriend. But if that wasn't bad enough, he can't go a single day without seeing her face. Peter does make plans to see her play one evening, however, but because he's Spider-Man, he has to follow trouble. Needless to say, he didn't make it. Later on, there's this great scene where Peter tries making bad excuses for why he didn't show up over the phone. MJ didn't pick up, but she's listening, and she's not too happy. Though, it's pretty understandable. This good friend of hers has become distant and can't keep a promise. Meanwhile, Peter knows that if they're together, she'll become a target. I really like how after Peter gets cut off, he fake confesses that he's Spider-Man. It shows how much he wants to tell her, but can't. It's a sad situation, but it makes for some damn good storytelling. You feel for both of these characters. There's no antagonist in this situation, and I really like that. And I think this is played out really well during the dinner party. So because Peter's ass is broke, he asks Mr. Jameson to pay him in advance, and we get one of the funniest bits in the trilogy. <laughs> Serious? I love this guy. So instead of paying him in advance, Jameson as Peter attends his son's party, and things don't go too well for him. Harry is drunk and angry, and his run in with MJ isn't pretty. Her telling Peter off for not being a great friend is definitely mean, but it's pretty understandable. Peter hurt her feelings pretty bad, and he knows this. You can see it in his eyes. Like I said, you feel bad for both of them. You can sympathize with Peter, but you also understand why MJ is so upset. Nobody's the enemy, nobody is superior, which is why their conflict works. The rest of the evening it doesn't go too well either. Harry slaps Peter right across the face in front of everyone, and then MJ's boyfriend announces their engagement right after. Then he has to take a picture of it. God, you can just see the utter defeat in Peter's face. It's devastating. Then once he leaves the party, he swings through the city only to find out that his powers aren't working. 
This leads to an interesting part of the film. We start to see Peter have serious doubts about being Spider-Man, which brings me to what makes this movie so special. This film isn't just about defeating a bad guy, it's about Peter's struggle, and it's all done in such a down-to-earth way. Like if someone in the real world was actually Spider-Man, this is probably what would happen to them. I love how this film shows a lot of bitter moments that really make you feel for Peter, whether it's him seeing MJ with another guy, or him falling to the ground right after losing his powers. So what does he do about all this? Well, he quits. He quits being Spider-Man. And it seems to pay off. We get this montage set to the song Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, and it's great. Sure, it's beyond cheesy, but it's definitely on a purpose. I mean, there's a guy named Freeze Frame at the end. You, you can't get more on the nose than that. But it's a brilliant scene showing Peter finally living a normal life. He's got a smile on his face, he's passing his classes, and when a police car drives by, he just takes a bite out of a hot dog without a care in the world. It does such a good job showing the contrast between his life then and his life now. I love this scene a ton. It's iconic for a reason. But Peter's happiness doesn't last very long. The man finally shows up to MJ's play and goes to talk to her afterwards, yet he's still met with resentment. He also works up the courage to tell Aunt May what really happened on the night of Uncle Ben's death, but instead of being forgiven outright, May pulls her hand away from Peter and leaves the room without saying a word. It's such an impactful scene. Peter quickly learns that things aren't going to be perfect just because he gave up Spider-Man. But this movie does such an incredible job dissecting Peter Parker as a human being. In fact, this film is very human. These are some real emotions, and you just feel for these characters. When you see that look of utter defeat on Peter's face, it's tangible. Spider-Man 2 isn't just a superhero movie. It's an amazing character study of a guy living a double life. Later in the film, Peter notices a burning building reminiscent of the one in the first film. At this point, he's quit using his powers, but he still runs away and saves a little girl. It's a heroic moment, even without superpowers. But things aren't perfect here either, as someone didn't make it out. If Peter was still Spider-Man, that guy would still be alive. However, his tipping point it doesn't come until he meets MJ at a coffee shop where she's captured by Doc Ock. Well, yeah, I haven't talked about this guy yet, have I? We first meet Dr. Otto Octavius in the beginning of the film, and he makes a pretty good first impression. He's well-respected, incredibly intelligent, charismatic, and on the verge of a breakthrough. Renewable energy for all, he says. But his little experiment doesn't go too well. His inhibitor chip breaks and the arms take over his mind, turning him into a cold-hearted supervillain. Now, do I like him more than a Green Goblin? No, but he's still a fantastic villain. Earlier I mentioned how human this movie feels, and I think Doc Ock is a good reflection of that. At the core, Doc Ock isn't a bad person. He's just being mind controlled into doing bad things. In one scene you can actually see him going back and forth with the arms, showing that his true self is still there. Doc Ock, like every other character in this movie, is empathetic, which makes his character work really well for this movie. I especially love how at the end, Peter gets through to the real Otto Octavius, and he ends up sacrificing himself in order to save the city. He dies a hero, and I think that's the best way he could have gone out. But hey, as a villain, he's pretty great. But there's a bit of humor to his character, and it's a blast watching him and Spidey fight. And now the fights in the first film are certainly great, but in 2 it's ramped up to 11. They're a blast to watch, and I love how they really take advantage of the character's abilities. I'd say the train scene is without a doubt the best fight in the movie. There's so much momentum in the sequence, and it never lets up. You got him fighting on the side of the train, Spidey swiftly dodging other trains, then Doc Ock starts throwing people and Spidey saving them. It's awesome stuff. I also love how Peter pushes himself to the absolute limit in order to stop the train from crashing. It's such a heroic moment. Spider-Man 2 really is a fantastic movie, just great and iconic scenes one after another. It does a wonderful job at breaking down who Peter Parker is, and the film never loses focus on that. Everything that happens reinforces these themes of choice, duality, and consequence, whether it be through Peter's relationships or his own mental battles. This movie wears its heart on its sleeve, and I've really come to appreciate what this film does even more now. And while I'm no film buff, I think I can safely say that Spider-Man 2 is an absolute classic.
Spider-Man 3 is a weird movie with a weird reputation. Some will say that it's simply a bad movie, some will say that it's ironically great, and some find it genuinely enjoyable. As for me, I remember liking it ironically in middle school, but now, I absolutely love it. Sometimes for the wrong reasons, yes, but a lot of it is legitimate. For one, this movie is never boring. So much goes on. Like within the first handful of minutes, five plots are set up. We see that Peter's ego is bloated, Harry and Peter are on really bad terms, this mysterious black goo follows Peter home, Peter wants to marry MJ, and we get introduced to one of the film's villains, Sandman. He might not be my favorite villain, but he's solid and I really like how he's set up. Flint just wants to be with his daughter but can't because of his criminal background and his wife not letting him. His daughter is the person he cares about the most, and this is shown in a beautiful way when he becomes Sandman. The way the sand is animated looks fantastic to this day, and there's a lot of emotion to it, especially when he can't pick up the necklace. Sandman definitely reminds me of Doc Ock and how they're both very human characters that you can sympathize with. Obviously, Doc Ock is the better of the two, but I still enjoy Sandman for who he is. But he's not the only villain in this movie. Spider-Man 3 is pretty infamous for having a few too many villains, one of which being Harry Osborn. He had a grudge against Spider-Man all throughout the second film, and when he found out it was Peter all along, things were done between the two of them. So in order to get his sweet revenge on Peter, he becomes the new Goblin, th then gets knocked out in a comically abrupt fashion. Yeah, his villain persona isn't in the movie for very long, but I honestly don't mind that since what they did after the fact is really cool. Harry wakes up in the hospital with short-term amnesia, and his hatred towards Peter is completely gone. He's back to his normal, charming self. It's cool seeing Harry and Peter being friends again. This heavy weight has been lifted off of Peter's shoulders, but it doesn't last long. I'll get into this more later, but Peter and MJ are not on the best of terms in this film, and at one point MJ decides to go over to Harry's place. They cook some omelets, dance around the kitchen, and because of Harry's undeniable charm, they kiss. Obviously MJ immediately regrets this, but Harry becomes angry, and the goblin spirit begins to resurface, thus bringing his memories back. He then viciously threatens MJ and forces her to break up with Peter. I love how in this part of the movie, Harry becomes this really sly asshole, which is shown off perfectly during the cafe scene. Peter tells him what just happened, and instead of faking things, Harry just tells him that he's the other guy. It's so stone cold and you can really see the disbelief in Peter's eyes. Then once he leaves the cafe, he's met with this devilish wink from Harry. And that wink, man, it's so good. Like it feels more powerful than his regular attacks. Harry might not be using his powers here, but he's attacking Peter emotionally, and it's pretty freaking great. How's the pie? So good. Now we get to the last villain in this movie. Venom. I don't like him. And now don't get me wrong, in the green scheme of things, Venom is actually my favorite Spider-Man villain, but here he just sucks. Though, let's talk about Eddie Brock himself first. Here he's played by Topher Grace, and I don't mind him actually. He's introduced as Peter's rival at the Daily Bugle and it works well. He's really cocky, he's full of himself, and he's a bit of a dick, making the interactions between him and Peter pretty fun to watch. He's not the best character in the trilogy or anything, but he's a solid character, for now. You see, after getting exposed by Bully Maguire at the Daily Bugle, he literally goes to a church and asks God to murder him. What? Like, I knew Eddie was a bit mean, but it's just so out of nowhere. I love it. But afterwards, some of the symbiote falls on his hand, and he becomes my least favorite version of Venom although I haven't seen the Tom Hardy movies. Now, look, Topher Grace played a perfectly fine Eddie Brock, but his Venom, he just doesn't fit whatsoever. They made him really skinny and weird looking, his voice barely changes so it isn't very threatening, and every time he talks, the symbiote retracts, so you have to look at his stupid face all the time. But to top it off, Venom is only in the film for like 15 minutes. Seriously? But hey, there's a reason for all this. As a lot of you probably know, Sam Raimi had never even wanted Venom in this movie, but one of the film's producers, 
Avi Arid insisted that Venom should be included in order to appeal to modern fans. Raimi's original vision was just Sandman and Harry as the villains, and while that would have made for a better film, objectively speaking, I wouldn't change it since I genuinely love what the symbiote brings to the movie pre-Venom. So first of all, I just find it incredibly funny how the symbiote is introduced at the very start of the film, but it doesn't become relevant until halfway. You can really tell that the shit was just shoehorned in because it literally just falls from the sky with no explanation. Then it just kind of hangs around the movie for a while, but once it becomes relevant, I really like it. It's revealed that Flint Marco, aka Sandman, was Uncle Ben's true murderer, which infuriates Peter. He became angry right after he died, and he becomes angry here. Now, the symbiote is attracted to this anger, so when Peter goes to bed trembling, we get this great scene of it wrapping itself around Peter's body, which creates the black suit. And it looks awesome. I don't know, something about this suit always looked cool to me. And while I like the comic design of it a little more, they still did an excellent job bringing it to the big screen. This new suit also directly affects Peter's mind. It makes him more powerful, but it also amplifies his dark side, the side filled with hate and vengeance. We see him track down Flint in his sewer where they get into a pretty brutal fight. This new Spider-Man does not hold back, so much so that he goes so far as to kill him. This new suit really does change him into something he's not, while also acting as a drug of sorts. Peter will turn to the black suit so he can feel that rush of power, and it's a pretty interesting plot point. Now, because of Peter's little addiction, he starts wearing the black suit underneath his regular clothes, and we get the one, the only, Bully Maguire. <laughs> This is peak cinema, and you can't tell me that it isn't. Like, yes, it's the dumbest thing ever, but I love it. You just see this man strutting around town with this smug look, not giving a shit that all these women are put off, aside from a few. He's just completely devoid of self-awareness. It almost reminds you of Johnny Bravo, and that dance man, it's iconic. Like at the time, this was probably genuinely stupid, but with the post-ironic internet humor of today, this montage is incredible. Hell, I kinda like this scene unironically. It cracks me up every time. I especially love the bits of him being this arrogant asshole at the Daily Bugle, the hair flip, him putting his feet on Jameson's desk, him flirting with Betty. It's just hilarious, man. I don't know what to tell you. The jazz club scene is equally stupid, but equally hilarious. There are just so many dumb, dick-headed lines packed into this scene to where I cannot help but to die laughing. Now dig on this. This scene is so absurd and out of character and they just ran with it. It's funny, I specifically remember cringing at the jazz club scene back in middle school. But not anymore, I think the shit is hilarious. Although things don't end well. Peter obviously caused a scene and security tries to escort him out. But he fights back and accidentally punches MJ right in the face. It's a real oh shit moment that hits genuinely hard and makes Peter question his actions. Oh yeah, now's probably a good time to talk about Peter and MJ's relationship, isn't it? Oh boy. So, at the start of this movie, Peter's ego is very bloated. The city loves Spider-Man now, he's balancing life, and he's finally with the girl of his dreams. But she's not doing the best. She gets a shot at Broadway, but gets let off. Now, let me remind you. The reason Peter and MJ's conflict worked well in 2 was because nobody was antagonized. And that's not exactly the case here. Like for example, MJ is upset by a bad review in the paper, and when she tells Peter he's just a dick and makes a conversation about himself, MJ is agitated of course, but then he sorta kinda tries to cheer her up right after. I don't know, it's really weird mixed messaging that only gets worse. At one point, the city holds a little Spider-Man appreciation event. MJ's bummed out about being fired, but Peter is reveling in his fame. So what does he do? Well, he kisses Gwen Stacy in front of a crowd of people, of course. And look, I understand that to Peter, it didn't really mean anything, but it's still a shitty thing to do. 
Especially since it's on the same day that you plan to propose to your girlfriend. Yeah, in this scene, man, it is painful. Peter's all excited, but MJ's rightfully pissed, which creates this awful tension. Then Gwen randomly shows up, making things even more awkward. Now, I completely get why MJ's not in a good mood here. It's perfectly valid. But this woman actually, legitimately pulls the... Are you seriously casually speaking to another female without my knowledge? Like, that's what you lead with? Not the kissing thing? Granted, she brings that up right after, but still. Their relationship in this movie is just ridiculous to me. But what really drives me nuts is when she visits Peter after he learns about Flint killing Uncle Ben. Keep in mind, this is soon after the date, and MJ comes in being compassionate, but then Peter's the dick? What? Why? They couldn't make up their mind. It's ridiculous. Which is why it's so much fun to watch. I don't genuinely hate the way their relationship is written in this movie. It might drive me crazy, but that's kind of the fun of it. In fact, that's what I can say for this entire film. A Spider-Man 3 is incredibly flawed and makes no sense on paper, but hell if it isn't a blast to watch. I always come out of this movie thoroughly enjoying it, which is why I can't bring myself to say that I love it in some ironic way. Like obviously me laughing at stuff like Bully Maguire has to do with irony, but things like the black suit, Harry's character, and Sandman are genuinely well done. And despite the fact that this film is packed with like 7 plots, they all weave together really well. It's very strange to me. So many things happen in this movie one after another, and I think that's the fun of it. You will never get bored during this movie. It's like a car crash of plots from other Spider-Man movies all colliding into this incredible mess that I love. But I can't really say that for the ending. Yeah, if there's any part of Spider-Man 3 that I genuinely dislike, it's the climax. When I'm watching this movie, it feels like the final fight just comes out of nowhere with no build-up. It tries really hard to tie up all these loose ends in the movie in such a short amount of time, and it doesn't work. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not awful. A Sam Raimi fight scene is a Sam Raimi fight scene, but it's a bit boring in the grand scheme of things. Plus, Venom is here and he sucks. The writers definitely did a great job at keeping the plots making sense throughout the film, but things crash and burn at the end. There was so much to resolve and not enough time to do it. I think Sandman suffers from this ending the most. This character had such a great setup, but the way they resolved his arc just feels... off. Flint approaches Peter and explains what really happened to Uncle Ben. Peter then forgives him and he just... floats away. That's it. Like yeah, it's a touching scene and all, but something feels unfinished. Now this is definitely a side effect of Venom being forced in the film. If Raimi had full control, I'm sure Sandman would have gotten the complete story he deserved. And while I would have loved to have seen what this movie could have been without the symbiote, I wouldn't have it any other way. Spider-Man 3 is a goddamn mess, but it's a lovable mess. It might not have a clear theme running through it unlike the films that preceded it, but it does have a Bully Maguire. It does have the cafe scene. It does have the black suit. And in a lot of places, it still has heart. You could certainly throw out a lot of genuine criticism at Spider-Man 3, but it's just too entertaining and memorable for me to even care about its issues. A lot of those flaws are part of why this movie is enjoyable. It's definitely my least favorite of the trilogy, but I'd be lying if I said I've ever seen another superhero movie quite like Spider-Man 3. The Raimi trilogy really is something special. All three of these movies have their own unique brand of greatness. The undeniable charm of one, and the incredible character study of two, and the total insanity of three make this one hell of a trilogy. But there's something to be said about how down to earth these films are, and I think that's where the love for Tobey Maguire's portrayal comes from. He plays the most down to earth and humbled Spider-Man that ever hit the big screen. The things he goes through and the emotions he feels are palpable. I really see what makes Tobey so damn special, and he's without a doubt my favorite iteration of the character. I was never too big on Andrew Garfield, like he's fine enough, but it didn't hold a candle to what came before. Plus the writing in those movies really held him back. And as for Tom Holland, I do really like him, but I can see why someone wouldn't. I myself am still a little indifferent towards how involved Iron Man is in his story. It definitely takes out that grounded feel that was in the Raimi trilogy, but it's still a good reimagining of the character. I think in an era of these huge cinematic universes, it was honestly really refreshing to come back to this original trilogy. 
You'd never see something like the fence scene or even Bully Maguire in a modern Marvel movie, which is kind of why they're so special. This trilogy's action-packed, it's funny, charming, heartfelt, iconic, and above all else, timeless. The hero, the adventure, Spider-Man! The DVD with spiderific experts like filmmakers commentary. Let mom and dad talk for a minute, will ya? Spider-Man archives. Who is Spider-Man? And much more. Spider-Man. We'll meet again, Spider-Man! You are amazing. Friday, November 1st on DVD and video. Rated PG-13.